Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Doug Lively. I am uh, with Raleigh Astronomy Club, and uh, we're um, so happy that all of you decided to join us for the introduction to astronomy. Uh, today, uh, it'll be myself uh, and Dana Bostic who will be actually leading uh, the discussion on uh, introduction to astronomy. I do ask that everybody keep your, um, your microphones muted and your video off. Uh, so that uh, we, Dana and I are trying to maximize our bandwidth to to, uh, to make it easier on everybody and so to kind of keep that screen lag down. You are welcome to use the chat. Uh, hopefully you're all familiar with Zoom chat. I encourage you to bring it up and put your questions in chat. Dana and I will, uh, during the presentation, Dana and I will briefly um, pause our, our lecture, our to answer questions. And so um, definitely please put questions in chat. And then at the end of our discussion today, we'll ask you, uh, we'll kind of open it up and then I'll maybe take a chance at unmuting the microphones and, and seeing um, you know, what you have to ask uh, verbally. So I, what I'd like to do is go ahead and get started. But, um, I do want to uh, kind of give um, a shout out and a thank you to uh, Phyllis Lang, who has been organizing um, the training sessions for, uh, for introductions to astronomy. This is the first in a series that will be happening over the next few weeks. Phyllis is the uh, Raleigh Astronomy Club's educational coordinator. She does a lot of the education and training uh, in the club. So I definitely want you guys uh, to if you get a chance to meet Phyllis or even just send her an email just to thank her for actually organizing these, um, these sessions, uh, they'll be really, really good. Uh, we are going to have, so today's introduction to astronomy is, uh, is going to be, again, one in a series. So please keep um, watching your emails. Uh, she will be sending out announcements as we have uh, successive programs. Also, we'll be putting those programs into the calendar. And if you want to be able to register for those programs, you will need to log into your RAC account because these are only viewable by members of RAC. This is one of the benefits and advantages to club membership. In a few weeks, though, we will make them available to the public as we have time to actually edit the videos and such. So anyway, so just definitely just keep that in mind as we go on. Now, as we're getting started, uh, again, I said that one of our uh, instructors today is Dana Bostic. Dana, I'm going to give you the floor for a few minutes just to give us um, a brief um, introduction to yourself and, and tell us what, what, who you are, how long you've been in Iraq, what kind of brought you to astronomy, and then, you know, and then I'll, I'll finish it up. Well, I'm Dana Bostic, and I've uh, been doing astronomy since I tore up my parents' um, space uh, encyclopedia when I was about eight years old. It's none of your business how far back that was. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, uh, when my children graduated from high school, uh, one of them three years ago, uh, four years, four, three years ago, I went ahead and joined RAC and decided to uh, be involved rather than uh, just occasionally go out. I um, I try to do outreach, uh, spend a little time doing that uh, with the Raleigh Astronomy Club. Also mainly do uh, a lot of um, observing on my own, sometimes with you guys, but a lot of times on my own. So that's who I am. I live in Garner, so I, I usually go south to, to do observing. Um, spend a lot of time with Al and Jim trying to run around behind them watch what they do All right <laughs> excellent dana uh, by the way you will hear dana and i uh bouncing uh, banter back and forth uh, we are yes. we are serious astronomers but we're not always very serious so <laughs> seldom, seldom serious seldom serious all right um so my name is doug lively i've been in the raleigh astronomy club i actually joined in, in 1996 so i've been in the club for about 27 years uh just to let you know i Always had a passion for astronomy back uh, as a very young, young child, and just uh, I've always enjoyed it. But life got in the way, uh, and so I actually didn't join uh, until very until later in life. I just knew that I had a passion for it, and that I wasn't getting any younger. And it was like time that I do something with that passion. 
So I joined again, joined about uh, 27 years ago, uh, not only not knowing very much about the night sky, again, just knowing I had a passion for it. And that's what Raleigh Astronomy Club helped me with. They helped me nurture that passion. And as I grew in my abilities with astronomy, I became better and 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 continued going on. Just to let you know a little bit about my background in uh, besides after coming with the club, uh, again, I kind of went through not knowing where the constellation Orion was in the night sky to becoming a master observer with the club. So I'm actually a master observer. I am also a NASA JPL solar system ambassador. Dana is also a NASA JPL solar system ambassador. So uh, even though you may hear reckless banter between the two of us, uh, we're all very serious about our study in astronomy. We will also show you how you can become a master observer as well. Raleigh Astronomy Club has a lot of programs that will help you um, become stronger in your astronomy skills, but also ultimately uh, become really quite good at what you're doing. So we will introduce some of that to, uh, today. And uh, hopefully as you uh, interact with the rest of the club, you'll learn how to get better uh, and to see more objects. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and talk a, a, bit, a little bit about what our program is today. And we'll go to the next slide. We'll try to go to that. There we'll we try. Go. There we go. Finally, this is why we need the, the bandwidth to be as low as possible or as much <laughs> as possible. So, you know, we'll, we're, you know, astronomy is really one of those super vast areas of study. There's a lot in this and I'm continually learning new things, even though I've been in the club for again, 27 years there. <laughs> The learning just never stops. Astronomy is super vast. Just from the idea of where astronomy comes from, it literally means it comes from the Greeks. Astronomy, uh, Mia, is the Greek word for astronomy. And it means it's the study of the law that governs the stars and the heavens. That's literally what it means. And then we take the amateur, which it comes from the French, which is for the love of. And it basically just is someone who has a deep abiding love for studying the laws and motions of the stars. Again, so it, it, so it literally is Greek to everybody when it started out. Exactly. And then, okay. it, and then it becomes a love and a passion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so today, I, again, it's so vast. We're, we're not going to be able to cover everything in astronomy. But by the time you finish the series that, that Phyllis has put together, you're going to have a pretty good uh, idea of what astronomy is. Today, we'll talk about really literally um, what you see on the, on the slide here, you know, our nearest star, the constellations, um, you know, what can you see? What can you see with the naked eye? We'll talk about binoculars and telescopes, and then we'll talk a little bit about astronomy in North Carolina. Um, so uh, just uh, sit back and enjoy. And again, if you have any questions, just uh, go ahead and put them uh, in the chat. All right, let's go to the next slide. Actually get started. Oh, oh wrong direction. Back. Wrong direction. All right, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys here just a second. We're, if you can think about observing maybe just the nearest star in our sky, one that might have some planets around it, one that might even have life. Um, what do you think that is? Just uh, take a few seconds there to throw it in the chat, and then we'll... we'll uh, Ava we'll Gardner. Continue. Ava Gardner? I live in outside of Smithfield. Oh. I should note that I'm in Cary. So for those of you who are joining us from Cary and uh, West Raleigh, I'm accessible. All right, so I've, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, continue on. So we have uh, basically uh, someone has said Alpha Centauri, and Alpha Centauri certainly has some planets around it that we think uh, could actually harbor life. But the uh, nearest star that actually harbors life is this one, our own sun. So this is, uh, this is actually a picture from a couple of days ago from our sun. And... Uh, and you can see it's got a lot of spots. Uh, we'll talk about the solar sunspot cycle in a little bit. But uh, yeah, this is uh, our sun. Our planet is really the only one that we found life on. 
uh, there is some debate on whether there's intelligent life on our planet or not. Um, probably after listening to us today, you may decide differently. So Correct. let's go on. <laughs> before, uh, we, before we go too much further, I do want to make sure that you understand that observing the sun is not something to be taken lightly. Um, you hear a lot of people on the chat, on the, on the social media talking about how they like to worship the sun and, and just stare at the sun uh, on a daily basis from morning until it gets to where they can't you bear to look at it anymore. Please don't do that. <laughs> uh, you can get a really dangerous uh, malady called solar retinopathy. It's the, literally the blistering of your retina because of the sun. Our, the, the human eye is not designed to take on the full heat of the sun. In fact, we periodically have done a demonstration on astronomy days where one of our astronomers will put uh, an old style film canister on an eyepiece and then take their solar filter off and it literally burns through the uh, solar uh, the film canister in like about three milliseconds. So even a, a toy pair of binoculars or a telescope are not good enough uh, to shield you from looking at the sun. Putting on multiple pairs of sunglasses, a lot of you guys look at those sunglasses today and you look at that and you go, this guy says, protects from 99.99% of UVA and UVB radiation. Please don't believe that. There's actually nothing to back that up. It's complete, complete hype. They do help you as by darkening the sun and polarizing light. But in terms of passing UVA and UVB radi radiation, they're not very good at it. So please do not ever uh, look at the sun more uh, than briefly. The UVA and UVB radiation will cloud uh, your your cornea and your and your and the lens in your eye and so um, and then ultimately you can get blistering around your retina which will diminish your eyesight and sometimes it's permanent so yep. don't ever do that and never ever look at the sun without an approved solar filter smoked glass and dark sunglasses like they used to say back in the 1960s and the 70s will not protect you. And they actually found that out in the 1970s because a lot of people tried to do that with the 1970 solar eclipse. And we had a lot of people with blindness and impaired vision. So please don't do that. Um, you definitely have to use some type of protective filter with the sun, uh, the Vader solar filtering material or a hydrogen alpha filter, uh, which, is, which is made for solar. Please don't just get any hydrogen alpha solar filter. It has to be made for solar. Because some people will take a hydrogen alpha uh, filter that's made for a camera and use that, and that will not protect you. It has to be specifically for solar observing. You always want to check your filter before use. And the easiest way to do that is just to kind of hold it up in front of the sun and kind of move it around and make sure there aren't any holes. So if you have a hole or something like that, you can always use like, you know, a piece of tape or something, of uh, electrician's tape on either side of the filter to kind of plug that. It won't uh, diminish what you see from the sun, but it will, it will really protect your eyes. Um, or you can just make yourself like a little camera obscura with two pieces of cardboard kind of held like this, a pinhole in one and then, and then projecting against the side of another. And that will actually allow you to project the sun safely onto a piece of paper. And that's a really easy to do. Um, and then, you know, you can also look at some of the astronomical websites like uh, spaceweather.com that's a really good place to look at at the sun safely uh, they have great telescopes for, uh, for projecting the sun so here's a like a really super simple little uh solar observing telescope this is called a sun spotter now i uh, i don't recommend that you actually buy this uh this product because it's about 533 bucks and i think you could probably make uh make that on your own um probably off of, with a DIY project on the on the web. But in case you are interested, I am placing that in the chat. So you can actually go there and look at that, uh, that product. But this is very simple. It's just simply a, a, a little wooden frame with a hole in the, in the front frame. And then you can see how the sun's being projected on the on the, that, and you can literally like, for instance, this one's this one's done during solar minimum, so there are no sunspots. You can't see anything for the sun. But like now, as we're moving up into solar maximum, which means that the sunspots are beginning to increase on the sun's surface, 
uh, you would be able to see actual sunspots. They have like a little piece of paper here that you could actually draw the image of the sun and kind of sketch those spots for yourself. And so it's a lot of fun, especially for you and, and for kids. It's a great little learning tool. Again, it's very expensive, but at the same time, it's, it's also one of the safest ways that you can observe the sun and actually see some of the solar disk without harming yourself. It's not going to work today. Yeah, today um, is a little, uh, <laughs> not, not one of those days that we could actually use it. So yeah, nope. good point there, Dana. All right, let's, <laughs> let's go next. You know, there's also kind of some really interesting things that you can do with the sun. Um, how many of you guys know what this little figure eight image is called? Just put it in chat there really quick. All right, I don't see anything going on in the chat, but that's okay if you don't know what it is. Up until I actually first saw this, I never knew myself. This is known as an analema. And if you were to put a camera out on a, in this case, it's a mountaintop in, in Crimea, but you could do this in anywhere at the coast or even here in, in, uh, in Cary, where I live. Um, if you had a really good unobstructed view of the sun, you could put a, a camera base like a, like a tripod down and then at the same time, every 10 to 15 days, go out and take a picture of the sun. This is the picture that you would see. And it's, and it's uh, not quite the orbit that the Earth makes around the sun, because it's also, also a function of time as well. But it is, uh, uh, you would, after the, after the end of a year, wind up with this figure eight on, you know, as if you stacked all your photos together and, and turned them into one photo, known as an analema. Um, Interesting point right here. This there's we see two sun images for almost every day, but then we have this one sun image there, and that's actually signifying the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox when the sun is actually in the same position at the same time in the night in the daytime sky. So some really interesting things. Some other really cool things that you can see uh, with the sun uh, during the winter time which I don't really know that we had a winter except for maybe a few days. Today's one of them. Uh, you can see sun dogs. That's right up here. Uh, as you can see, my, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor moving around. Uh, these are yes. really cool. Um, sun dogs, literally that term actually comes to us from the ancient Greeks. These are the dogs that used to precede Apollo's chariot as he made his course through the sky. And so the sun dogs, um, these are really just ice crystals. You can see this really nice halo effect here because it, you are kind of getting a refractive lens as you're looking through ice crystals. But there's not just this kind of sun dog. Sometimes they can appear as columns depending on the shape of the ice crystals. So that's kind of a neat thing that you can just visually view. You don't need a telescope or anything, just your own, uh, your own eyes to, to view that. To the right, I have rainbows and a double rainbow. I, I definitely love to see these uh, whenever I get a chance. And so that's another thing you can view. Uh, down below on the lower right, we have Aurora Borealis. Now this picture is actually from, from, uh, from Holly Springs, North Carolina. Uh, back in 2003, we had a very active solar cycle. We had uh, two, two coronal mass ejections come from the sun and they hit the Earth's atmosphere. One of them collapsed Earth's atmosphere and the other one came in and we could actually see Aurora Borealis down here in the South. And several of the club members at that time were able to get photos of that. Uh, this one is by Eric Honeycutt, who was uh, at that time a club member. And he's literally, he was literally at an intersection in Holly Springs, North Carolina. And he saw it happening at the intersection and he jumped out of his car and took that photo. Now, don't do that. <laughs> okay because that was back in 2003 when holly springs didn't hardly have anybody living in it now today holly springs is a burgeoning town so you might get run over so but anyway you you with as we are now like as i said earlier we are going up into solar maximum over the next five years we should see a lot of really great sunspot spot activity so be prepared so you could see these at night um, over on my, in the, kind of in the middle here, we have an eclipse, but this doesn't, this is not just any eclipse. This is actually an annular eclipse. So the annular eclipse um, is uh, a, a situation where the moon is actually further away from the earth. Uh, and so it doesn't quite cover the sun. 
And so you get um, an annular, you can actually get a, an eclipse that we call annular. And so it, it looks like literally that ring of fire. And every time you, uh, you hear this, you think of Johnny Cash singing ring of fire, you know, well, this, that's definitely um, an opportunity to see. We are going to be able to see um, uh, an annual eclipse uh, later this year uh, on October 14th. And um, so that will be really neat to see. You'll have to be out west to see it because it's actually going, um, uh, going to be in the, um, in, the, in the west, something that will it'll, it'll only be a western event. So if, you have, if you've always been thinking about taking that trip out west, uh, right around uh, Albuquerque and in Utah is probably going to be the closest that you'll be able to uh, come from Raleigh to be able to see that. I've, uh, if you're checking out the chat, I've just put in uh, two links to eclipses that are occurring. Uh, in April of 2004, we'll have a total eclipse. That eclipse will be more accessible to everybody because it will actually go from about out the El Paso area all the way up into Canada. So a lot about uh, Texas, uh, Tennessee, Indiana, Ohio, uh, New York, all, all up into, and even on to over Niagara, you'll be able to see that the total eclipse on, on in April of 2024. Again, if you'll check the chat out, I've put links in the chat so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, in, those are interactive eclipse maps. You can click them. You can pinch them out or uh, expand them if you're, you're on a PC, and you'll be able to see down to you know, the street level of where you need to be um, to see the eclipses. The other things are sunsets and sunrises. A lot of people love to photograph sunsets and sunrises. This, sun, uh, this sunset here is one I took over Crabtree Lake uh, a few years ago. It's a really picturesque uh, place to be. But there are people in Cary, uh, I know, that actually every day go out and take pictures of the sunset or the sunrise. So Again, these are things you can do. You don't have to have a telescope. You don't necessarily have to have a lot of astronomical knowledge to go out and capture these. You just have to be in the right place at the right time. And that's the key. A lot of times with the things that we look at uh, with, in terms of sun dogs and rainbows or Borea, Aurora Borealis, these eclipses and stuff, you just have to be in the right place. And literally, a camera is all you need. So uh, It doesn't even have to be a fancy camera. It doesn't. It could be a cell phone camera. And we've got some really great, uh, we got a few pictures of, that were taken by cell phones. In fact, the one of the suns that there was, was taken off my, just a, just an iPhone 6. So <laughs> there, they, you can really have a, a great chance uh, to have some yep. fun with a camera. All right, let's go to the next slide. If you'll give me just a moment here. All right, and then finally, we'll talk about Aurora Borealis uh, a little more. Earth has this amazing magnetic field. It really does pr protect us. If we didn't, it's on 24-7, which is really great. Unlike the other planets like, like Mercury, Venus, and Mars, our magnetic field is on 24-7 to protect us from any radiation. Those planets, their magnetic fields don't kick in until actually they get the first dose of radiation, and then they turn on. So it doesn't bode well for, for life and such like that on those planets because they can literally get sapped very quickly. But I did on this picture to the lower left here, you'll see that really bright spot. That's an X-class flare that we actually had April 27th of 2022. And those X-class flares are large enough to snap and throw material off of the sun's surface. That material that going fly, you know, being flung off the Earth's surface, off the sun's surface, is known as a coronal mass ejection or a CME. And uh, when they are in kind of in that lower limb area, they're in the prime spot to to hit Earth. Now Earth is moving, so a lot of times we'll just miss it just by minutes, you know. But it uh, that 17,000 mile, 500 miles per hour that we are traveling through the night sky uh, in our own orbit is just enough to keep us as a moving target. But occasionally we get struck by those. And when they do, all that energy, if you look right here on the right side, is concentrated on the poles. But if it's strong enough, it can literally come down low enough for us to see in the United States. <clears throat> and so that, again, when we get two of those, the first one kind of clears out all the inter, uh, inter solar medium. 
and the second one comes in and that's what really hits our magnetic field and makes it viewable for us down in North Carolina and other states as well. So again, with us going into solar maximum, that will actually be uh, an opportunity in the next few years to possibly see Aurora Borealis down here in North Carolina. How can you know when that's going to happen? Go to this site, www.spaceweather.com. It's got a lot of great information on it and you can literally, uh, it's a great opportunity to see uh, Northern Lights. Uh, and they'll tell you what's going on with the sun. They've got a lot of great other, other great information on there. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Dana now and uh, Dana's gonna talk to us about uh, constellations. All right, Dana. So uh, can anybody tell me what the difference between an asterism and a constellation is? And it's not a medical condition. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Where you at, Anna? I know you're there. Where you at, Jim? <laughs> it's a start so, group? Yes. So <laughs> if, if you'll go to the next one. So a constellation is basically the idea is we have to map out the sky. And so the uh, IAU, the um, International Astronomical Union, has mapped out the sky for us. And they've tried to use um, our our mythological um, constellations, you know, they came up with Orion or Leo and these kind of things. And so when you, when you look up at the sky, these are actually constellations. These are actually um, mapped out areas of the sky that belong to Orion. They're not just the Orion area. The best example to me is um, uh, Ursa Major, Ursa Major, Versus, yeah, okay, so these are constellation facts. So um, it's, it's an actual area, not just what you see. An, an asterism is what you see, whereas a constellation is an actual mapped out area. So as you see at the bottom, the IAU does both of those. So yes, um, this, that is one of the way, yes. So that's, thank you, Doug. So the best example I have is that the Big Dipper is an actual asterism. It looks like a dipper, but it's actually in the constellation of Ursa Major. And so um, they, they, the, the asterisms are also usually something that are familiar to our eyes, like the V down at the bottom. Um, but as I said, that explains it up there at the top. Yes. <laughs> they, they usually lie... Um, all of these are, are um, basically based on our eye. So they, they, while they don't interact with each other, those stars that are in the Big Dipper, they don't interact with each other. It's, it's, it's not like one place in the sky. They just look like they're all together from Earth's perspective. Yeah, very good. And you know that V that, uh, that, that Danny was referring to, if you look here in the lower right-hand corner, Mm -hmm. uh, that V right here actually uh, is, a, is an indicator. The star that we have, the kind of that dash on there is called Bernard star, which is actually headed towards Earth or towards our, our solar system. And it will pass uh, by our sun uh, in a few thousand years. Um, and it'll be, a, it'll be a few light years away. So it's actually not going to affect our, or disrupt our solar system in any way. But this little V is just this little shape that we see in the night sky. And it's, mm -hmm. it's actually kind of pointing to where Bernard's star is. And, and there's actually, if you kind of do the research, you'll see that there's actually, they have these maps, it's mapped out by, by, by decade where the star is going to be um, as with relation to this V. You can actually see this through a, through a, a small telescope. It's uh, quite easy to, to pick out. So. I think it's kind of neat to look at the way the constellations are put together. If you go to the to the next slide, Doug, yep. um, you have to kind of wonder what the IAU was drinking when they came up <laughs> with the map. I mean, look at Draco down there. I mean, the the, the little um, if you can show it with your with your mouse, Doug. I mean, what in the world? No, Draco. Yeah, uh, left Draco. Left. Yeah. You know what? I am. Uh, it, I'm it's having the dragon. Seeing. The yeah. dragon. Off to the right. Oh, there we go. Right there. There you go. What, what were you people thinking when you came up with that? But that's the mapping. So it's like puzzle pieces in the sky. And these are the actual constellations. Yep. And so 
you can see Ursa Major up there at the top. And obviously the Big Dipper is only about a, a third to a half of the actual constellation. So the okay. asterism is the Big Dipper, but the, the constellation is Ursa Major. Yeah. So you can also have some other fun with, uh, with asterisms because uh, we look over here at the, at the constellation Boots or Buades, depending on how you pronounce it. If you kind of uh, strip off these other stars, it looks like a, an ice cream cone. So this part that, that looks like a cone, that would be an asterism, mm -hmm. you know, whereas you have a much larger piece. And a lot of, I, I hear at some star parties, when you, especially when we have kids around, they, they okay. teach kids of what this looks like by saying, oh, you look for the ice cream cone in the sky. And then after you've eaten your ice cream, you have a smile right here at uh, Corona Borealis. So uh, it's a, one of those kind of fun things that you can do, although Corona Borealis is actually the constellation, but um, you, uh, you, know, you can have some fun with those shapes that you see in the sky. They're not necessarily confined to a dipper. I don't know how you find a bear out of the Ursa Minor or Ursa Major, but there you go. <laughs> well, and, and again, there's 88 of them for the entire sky. We can see, right. what, 39 in the Something northern like hemisphere? Yeah. 38, 39 in the northern hemisphere. Depending on where, where you're at. I mean, you get down to Key West and you see, all, you can actually dip, you know, peer down and see some of the, uh, some of the southern constellations. But for most of us, yeah, right about that. All right. all right, perfect. All right. Well, Doug, what can you see? Well, before we talk about what we can see with our naked eye, uh, are there any questions uh, that you've got? Uh, I don't see any. Let's see if let me let me just go through the chat here and see if we've got any questions. Uh, yep, I don't see any questions in chat right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that means that we are su sufficiently boring people to death. So, all right, everybody, wake up. <laughs> all right, so let's talk a little bit about what we can see with uh, with the naked eye. Believe it or not, uh, you don't need a, a, t a telescope to, again, to observe. And you got to remember that for, you know, let's, you know, for a good, you know, for millennia, untold millennia, Mankind has looked up at the night sky without the aid of a um, of a tool like a telescope, and really up until that time, uh, they had some very very primitive tools, uh, which primitive man actually used uh, very very well. Uh, if you go to Astronomy Days, sometimes we have uh, a, an exhibit on on the um, on ancient astronomers and ancient astronomy equipment, and it's really quite interesting. Uh, but uh, just with the naked eye, you, you know, of course, the sun, the moon, um, you know, uh, at least six of the planets you can see uh, with the uh, or uh, with the naked eye. Maybe I'm sorry, five, so to speak. Your uh, Uranus and, and Neptune are pretty difficult to see. Not anymore. You can't yeah. See anymore. But um, you can also you know, satellites and rocket launches. Uh, it used to be, when I, you know very rare that you could see a satellite going through, but now we have thousands of satellites and space junk floating around our, our planet. And so those are pretty easy to see. Rocket launches, you can actually see here in North Carolina, uh, any SpaceX rocket going up to the uh, International Space Station, you can actually, I can actually, I've actually viewed that here uh, in Cary, North Carolina. So it's, it's pretty easy to see. Meteor showers are a lot of fun. We'll talk about those in a minute. Of course, comets, conjunctions, and occultations. Uh, some of the, so there are some deep sky objects, and I'll, I'll point those out uh, a bit. These really interesting things called flares. And of course, a wonderful thing called light pollution. <laughs> so we'll talk about that as well. All right, let's get on. So the moon, I see, I think, yep. So for the moon, moon is one of my favorites uh, to actually to observe. Yep. Uh, I, love, I love that. Uh, and in fact, if you're interested in actually observing the moon, uh, we've got a really fun program that you can actually uh, pick up and start working on yourself. I'm going to put it in chat here as we're talking. And uh, you, can, you can certainly do that. And if you um, have even just like a small telescope, it doesn't have to be very, very big. You can actually uh, complete that entire uh, program in about a month because uh, that's about how long the moon's actual phase is. 
and it's a lot of fun. I've done it myself, and it's it's pretty easy to do. Um, anyway, the moon is really amazing. It's it's our closest neighbor, 248,000 miles on average away from us. Um, it's got um, it does so many amazing things besides the tides and 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 helping us actually oxygenate our oceans. It also as it goes around the earth, it kind of helps to warp those tectonic plates to keep that tectonic movement going. It also places friction on the earth's core, which keeps it molten and keeps it spinning. And we want to keep a spinning molten core because with a spinning molten iron core, that creates a beautiful magnetic field that protects us, allows us to enjoy the aurora borealis rather than to fear getting uh, zapped by the sun. So the moon does a lot for the earth. The earth sun moon relationship is unique, not only in our solar system, but currently we have discovered no exoplanets, exosolar planets that have this kind of relationship. And the moon is really important to not only preserving life, but also to in keeping life going. And one of the things that it does in preserving life is it is also our last defense when we have material coming out from uh, end of, into us from space that wants to crash into Earth. So asteroids uh, trying to hit the Earth or comets um, literally are usually disrupted by the moon's uh, gravitational field. And so we have very few impacts that occur on Earth. But if you look at the moon, you can look at just look at the moon face and it's really taking it on the chin for Earth, all these dark, areas, which we call mare, are literally impact basins where the moon, uh, an impactor has hit the moon's crust, broken it open, and a huge tsunami of magma has just flowed across the face of the moon, creating all these dark basaltic flows, which we call mare. And the reason why that's called mare is because when Galileo first started looking at the moon, he saw the dark areas as oceans and the light areas uh, he called Tieri or Earth, so Earth-like. So yeah, the moon's really interesting. But besides Mare and the Tierra and uh, uh, and craters, there are a lot of really interesting lunar formations that you can learn about in that program that I just put in chat. So definitely don't be afraid to open that up. As a Raleigh Astronomy Club member, you are um, uh, you do get to do these uh, these programs for free through our partnership with the Astronomical League. We'll talk a little more about that later, but this is a, a free service for you, a Raleigh Astronomy Club member. So please take advantage of these things. So, right. so Doug, this um, the moon picture you got there, um, mm -hmm. it's to let everybody to, uh, if whether they're interested, it's uh, one of my favorites is when it's very, very thin. Mm -hmm. And you get to see really large mountains, and then you can get Lunar X and Lunar V. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, these I should, are, yeah, I should ahead. have put some of those pictures out there for that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's a, it's a formation on the moon where the mountains are set up uh, just right so that as the sun comes over, it, it actually hits those mountains like hitting the top of Mount Everest before it hits round you are and it shows and it looks like from earth it looks like a big giant x on the moon not yeah. the whole moon but just a little place on the moon yeah so if um if you guys stick around uh to the after the uh after the program um i can actually bring up a couple of those pictures and stuff like that so there there is really cool it's really cool to and, and dana, as dana pointed out so actually uh, what i have here is a picture of the full moon i actually pulled this off of uh the um, alpha of uh, alpha of a lunar map, uh, but the really the best time to actually observe the moon is actually along the shadow, the the moon's shadow, which we call the terminator, and so um, it's uh, it that's where you actually see the the best relief of craters, and uh, and and literally spires and spikes and things like that. Um, along that terminal, you get that best uh, interaction of, of contrast between light and dark. That's really the best time to observe the moon. It really is. And it's really, it, and it's, if you just sit there and watch it, you can literally see the shadow change as it's going. So you can literally, if you're like looking at it like a little crater that has a peak in the center of it, you can literally see that, that peak get bigger and uh, you know, longer and longer and longer 
Um, so it's, it's pretty cool. So definitely just because we've already been to the moon, don't take the, well, been there, done that attitude. Just go out and look for, at it for yourself. There's a lot of work that we still have to do on the moon, which is why we now have the Artemis program and we're going back. So, and but, before anybody asks, we can't see anything we've left on the moon. Not from Earth, anyway. Not from Earth, <laughs> correct. Yeah, exactly. Solar observer, I guess. We can. Yeah, we do have lunar orbiters that are going around the moon. And lunar see those. Yeah. So, all right. So let's go on to the next one. I think Dana. I think you're up for the next one. So, so um, let me change that slide over and. There you go. So the planets are Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These are ones that you you see the most in the night sky. And if you people find out that you're interested in astronomy, they'll ask you what the lights are in the sky. I've got a sister who's a runner, and she asks me all the time, what is that? Um, if you've been out within the past, say, three to four weeks, um, you have seen venus and jupiter dancing and um one was up higher near the moon and then came down and so these are these are to me a lot of fun to look at uh back in june there was a um and it, i think it made the news uh where all of the ones you see here were actually up and so i spent the night in an old 87 toyota pickup with my telescope set outside of it and I got up about 3 30 in the morning and Saturn uh, Uranus and Neptune were where the scope could find them but then at about 5 30 ish in the morning Mercury Venus Mars Jupiter and Saturn you could look and they were all lined up in the sky it was very very pretty there were lots and lots of pictures that people made um so these are definitely ones uh, that, are, that are fun to, to look at. Venus with a moderately small scope or binoculars, you can get a, a crescent that it's not as beautiful as the moon and big as the moon, but you can definitely tell there's a, there's a crescent there. Um, you can, uh, Saturn is very enjoyable the first time you look through it with binoculars or uh, even a very small telescope everybody I've ever shown that to lights up when they see it. Um, Jupiter, they always, you know, you've always got um, a bunch of, um, you always have the four planets around it. Sometimes one's behind it or two's behind it, but, but uh, you have the moons of Jupiter uh, dancing around that you can again, see with binoculars. Um, and if you're patient enough, you can actually see them over time move some of yep. them actually go uh, move across the surface as we call that a transit uh you can literally see the shadow of the moon on the cloud bands as that's moving over and yep. then you can see them go behind the planet see them emerge from behind the planet it's pretty cool um this sky map that we're showing you here is actually that that day june 24th where the planets were all aligned um, and it was a it was a spectacular sight. I got out early in the morning and, and took a look and it was it was pretty amazing. So, I mean, these things occur over time and getting I just want to say is that getting a good sky mapping program that allows you to kind of see this stuff um, in advance is good. If you subscribe to uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, uh, this is actually from Sky and Telescope. Uh, you get access to their website. They actually have this on their website. So you can always uh, kind of look at the, the sky at a glance. They also give you some really good information about um, where to look. Um, we have some great sky planning software. Phyllis, our own Phyllis Lang writes a, um, a software package that's actually distrib distributed internationally called Deep Sky Planner. And it's a great way for planning your observations and stuff like that. But Definitely. Or you can get something like a, a program like Stellarium and use that to um, to I'll look at the chat. Yeah. Let me I think I've got that. Oh, did you do it? OK, thanks. Dana. I did it. Yep. Oh, perfect. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, I mean, again, these are as Dana is saying, these are things that you can see um, again without having to put a lot of money into a telescope. We'll talk about binoculars in a minute, but binoculars are a really economical way to get into astronomy. 
um, and even uh, see dark, and you can even see deep sky objects with them. Uh, so getting a, a, a tool or something like that to help you know where to look in the night sky is, is really good. All right, keep, uh, continue on there, Dana. Well, all I was going to, the last thing I was going to add is you were about to talk about binoculars. One of the things I advise most people that are fairly new is they, they think astronomy means telescope almost. Exactly. And it's yeah. like, please don't buy a telescope. Please learn a little bit about the sky and enjoy the night sky first before yeah. you ever, because that just complicates it up. So Plus two, if you are a club member and you live in Wake County, you can take advantage of our telescope loaner program. So we really want to encourage people to try before you buy. And like Dana said, uh, do take advantage of some of your, the more economical ways of uh, looking at the night sky than just thinking you have to go out and buy a telescope, which you don't. Right. All right, man. All right. All right. We're ready for the next On to the next one. All right. All right. Next one. All right. There we go. Woohoo. Is this yours or mine? Uh, either one oh, yours. Oh, it's like it's mine. Okay. All right. Uh, cool. Me meteor showers. One of my favorite events. I love doing this. Um, so, I mean, the we have regularly scheduled meteor showers throughout the year. In fact, there's actually about one a month, but there are only three that are really active, and that's the Perseids, the Leonids, and the Geminids. And those all happen right around August 12th, uh, November 17th, and December 13th. These are really cool events to watch. Now, what are these things? We've, again, you know, we've, it's been years, but we've, we've figured out what they are is they're literally, as a comet comes by the Earth, um, if it crosses Earth's plane of orbit, uh, all the stuff that the solar wind blows off the comet just sits out there floating around in a cloud. Eventually, the Earth comes around. It's a kind of, this is the kind of the cloud, and Earth comes around and kind of runs into that cloud. And when it does, that's when you have a meteor shower. Now, anytime you're out at night looking at the night sky, it, it, again, without a telescope, just sitting out in a lawn chair, you'll see stuff falling into, you'll see like, which it might be meteors or whatever. Uh, some of those are actual debris that's just sitting out there falling uh, that is a, co a cometary fragment or something. We call those sporadics. They'll fall into the Earth's atmosphere. A lot of it's space junk because now we have a lot, a lot of junk floating around in our in, uh, in near Earth orbit, and occasionally that will fall into the into the atmosphere. So uh, anytime anytime you see something like that at night, it's either going to be space junk or what we call a sporadic, so, some debris that that has has been captured by Earth's gravitational pull and falls in. But the cool thing is, is when we really do get to these meteor showers, again the Perseids, the Leonids, and the Geminids, these are especially the most active ones that we have. Uh, you'll get to see um, now bright meteors uh, hitting the uh, hitting Earth's atmosphere and then kind of burning up. Most of these are about the size of a grain of sand, and the really bright ones are only about the size of a of a pebble. So they're not very big. There's not any any uh, danger of being hit by one, but um, they are they are there. Um, now, usually you have to wait until night. Are really late at night before you see that. And the reason why is because we name these uh, meteors, meteor showers after those constellations that they're represented in. So usually when Earth is first fa facing the Perseids head on, that's when you're actually seeing, we're entering that debris cloud and it's coming right into, into Earth. Same way with the Leonids, constellation Leo, the Geminids, constellation Gemini. And so it takes, you know, it's kind of like if you're in, a, let's say you're, you're in a, so, a snowstorm or even a rainstorm, if you're not actually running, driving right into the rain or driving right into the snow, you hardly see anything. But the moment you turn into the blizzard or into, the, into where the rain is actually coming down on your windshield, then that's when you start seeing all this stuff happening. And that's the same way with, with meteor showers. It takes time for Earth to rotate around to where we're actually, it's actually hitting us straight on and so you it does take you into the early hours of the evening usually somewhere between 11 and 2 30 we're actually kind of rotating around where we're actually um you know we're at the night sky is actually pointing in the direction that earth is traveling in so that's why it kind of looks like this now i do want to say that when you hear about meteor showers uh from the news and everything and yeah. if you look here on the right, you rarely ever see this. I've actually only seen this once. 
and and that was a number of years ago. I can't even. I think it was 2007. I want, but I've only seen that once. Most of the time, you're going to see one every now and then. Even with the Perseids, you're going to get the news agencies saying, "Oh yeah, there's you're going to see, you know, 60 an hour." Well, 60 an hour is only one a minute, right? And that's and they even, have no way to predict it. And they have no way to predict that. Sometimes nope. the debris cloud, we might just glance that debris cloud and not get anything. So. Do take that with a grain of salt, um, <laughs> literally, because you 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 may be laying out all night and only see one or none. And of course, as we're going to talk about light pollution a little later on, light pollution is really uh, beginning to blank out what we can see from meteor showers, because even though they are bright when they come in, they're still not as bright as the lights over our town. And so a lot of the, the showers that could be really spectacular for us are pretty are pretty uh pretty dull and lackluster all right that's all hey I doug what's the ah. difference between a meteorite and a, and a, and a meteor wrong <laughs> i don't know about a meteor wrong but a, a meteor has not struck the earth yet it's been captured by earth's atmosphere but a meteorite is one that's actually able to make it all the way to earth now you'll have to tell me what a meteor wrong is it's when it hits a house or a car <laughs> oh that's wrong <laughs> All right. Good one, Dana. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's have... go. What's that? Oh, you oh, have my rim shot. shot. All right. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Here's the next one. Dana, you want to talk? I think this is yours. Right? Oh, sweet. Comets. Comets are always fun. Comets are uh, generally big balls of ice. Um, and uh, they start, yeah. or whatever, just garbage that um, from the early at, uh, early um, universe usually and they come in and when they get too close to the sun the sun starts heating them up and the debris come gets thrown out of the back of them we've had um we've had some some pretty good ones lately in 2020 neo wise um came through you could you could almost see it i mean you could see it naked eye but you could almost see the tail and everything naked eye but a pair of binoculars that's really right, right 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 there on the right that's it right yeah, there that's neo wise yep. and um I, I actually took the wife out to see uh, Neo Eyes, and uh, a tree fell behind us, and we quick we quickly took off. We didn't know why, and so the wiki, which I think you call it, but uh, 2002 E3 ZTF, um, that was a green comet lately, and and that one, Doug, I I stayed in the in the uh, truck again, and it got up at three, and it was 28 degrees, and mm -hmm. got up and the the tv and the media were telling us how it covered the whole back of the uh sky and i got up and i saw my smudge once again yeah in the sky yeah. well we also uh, had really bad weather for that one i mean of course, before, you know so it was at the time when we it would have been probably more visible for the public it was um uh, it and was the moon was in the wrong place the moon was the wrong place so there were a lot of things we had a lot of factors kind of Pushing that out. Neo wise was one of those that you literally, it was, it was in the good. summertime. Weather was nice. It was easy to get up and see it. You didn't, you weren't freezing to death, you know, so that was a lot of fun to see. Uh, that one I just took with a, with a cell phone adapter on a pair of binoculars. So uh, you, you can, you know, with a very minimal amount of, of equipment, take some really cool shots. So, yep. but they're a lot of fun to get out and see. I believe that. There are predictions that there are there is another bright comet coming in 2024. So again, as the Dane has kind of pointed out, um, and even in, in the in the media that that media interview I gave, you know, uh, I, uh, even though in the interview I said, you know, you can't really rely on these things because they could be spectacular, it could be a dud. That kind of got cut out. You know, they really all always want to like you know, uh, but you know, stay on the the thing that's most most positive for the public. But hey, that shouldn't ever prevent you from going out and trying to find it. I think our club had a lot of fun trying to find uh, comments was, wiki. Yeah, there was a lot of conversation around that. Oh yeah, yeah. And and I took pictures one night, didn't realize it was moving that fast. Oh yeah. So that was kind of neat to to see that. So there are other things. If you go to the next one, um, yeah. this. Uh, one of the things you can use to see what is up there, and and one of the things I, when my children were young, that we most enjoyed was the satellites going over, 
And satellites are kind of easy to, to pick out uh, when they go over because they're not blinking. Airplanes are almost always, as far as I know, almost always blinking. They, they have the little red light stuff. But there's a lot of debris up there. And when right after dark or right before sunrise, these, these objects will be up high where the sun is hitting them, but you're down in the darkness still. And so there's a lot of these things going by. International Space Station is another example. Um, the the uh, Hubble Space Telescope is an example. Uh, all of these things. So years ago, um, I wrote an article uh, advertising this Heavens Above, um, got published on this. And, and uh, this is a really... I think it's still a good program. It's the one I use um, to, to tell you, and it predicts ahead uh, when you can see like the International Space Station and things like that. There's, there's others out there now, but I still end up using this one a lot. So yeah, good site. It's a great site. Yep. All right. All right. Let's go on to the next one. All right. So as Dana mentioned uh, earlier about the, uh, about conjunctions, uh, this is the conjunction that happened on uh, March 1st. This was uh, uh, Venus and Jupiter were really close together in the night sky. Uh, I was actually able to manage to manage to keep, uh, to capture this. Uh, they were only about half a degree apart uh, when that happened. And these conjunctions happen periodically. Uh, maybe not every year, but yeah, once every couple of years or so, we get a really interesting interesting pairing. Now they appear to be close to one another, but we we all know that they're that they're literally millions of miles apart from one another. Uh, so you don't really have, you know, they're not really in danger of, of any kind of collisions. But it is kind of cool to look at these things and watch them. Um, another thing that we have if over here on the right, uh, I actually took both these pictures. Um, this is uh, this is a representative of what we call a grazing or an, oc an occultation. So every now and then, the moon actually kind of skirts past a star. And the star kind of like runs right across the edge of the moon. And that's a really cool thing because um, astronomically speaking, when we look at the moon, it looks like really smooth, but it's actually not. We have mountains sticking up in space. And so when the star kind of moves between the mountains, the star will go out and it'll come on and it'll go out. And, um, and so uh, if you were there to actually view this, and I do have a video, but I'm not going to play it. Uh, but you can literally see the star coming across the limb of the moon. And as it's moving across the limb, it goes in and out, in and out, in and out. And you, if you, a lot of people like to participate in citizen science projects, if you, if you take this, uh, this picture and you actually uh, run a timer on it, you can send this into the International Occultations and Timing Association, or IOTA for short. And uh, literally, that's what they're called. And uh, they'll take your data, and that helps them learn something about the lunar surface. And before we actually had detailed lunar mapping, this was the only way that they had of knowing where certain mountains were, giving a, a really accurate timing. You can figure out how tall, how wide the peak is, you know, and everything. So it's a lot of information that you can pick out from this. And literally, the star will literally wink in and wink out as it's passing between the mountains. And it's really cool to watch. So we do have these every now and then. And so you'll, you know, they, we haven't had one in, in, a, in a few years now. But uh, the next time one comes along, we'll usually send out a club email. And then you'll usually will wind up uh, with people spread out, out along about a mile. And we're all observing different aspects of these grazings and occultations. So it's a lot of fun. It's an actual space mountain. Yep, uh, literally an actual space mountain, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go to the next one. All right, and then some of the things that you can actually see, we won't uh, go into all these since we are, uh, we do have time, to, uh, time today, it's, just, it's getting uh, short, but um, you can see emission nebulae, uh, which is what the Orion Nebula is. That's actually a naked eye object. Uh, in some places, it used to be before lights got really bad here, we had, um, you could see M13, you could see M2, uh, some of the open clusters, you can still see M7, the Pleiades, uh, and you used to could see the Milky Way, uh, although now these days with, again, as light pollution is, is growing, uh, it becomes, uh, you know, much more difficult to see these things. Andromeda, you can still make out if you know where to look. 
but even Andromeda is getting washed out by the, by the lights. And so that's clearly a nice a nice segue into our next our next segment, which is is on uh, is on light pollution. But before we do that, we do want to take a break and see if there's any questions uh, in chat. If you've got any questions, go ahead and put those in chat, and we'll try to take care of them now. But due to time, we're not gonna we're not gonna put a, spend a lot of time waiting for chat. So if you got something burning you want to ask, ask it now. I will add to what you're saying, Doug, while you're on these these really hard to, to see, not really hard to see, but these lower end ones to see. One of the things that I make sure and tell newer astronomers is, please understand that almost everything you see in the night sky is a smudge. So yeah, exactly. TV, TV, it's, it's not a Hubble Space Telescope picture out there. So I want to set your expectation so that you don't get so frustrated because you will ruin a, a child's desire to do something if you get all frustrated and believe that you can go out and see this, you know, Andromeda galaxy spread across the sky. You right. start, you gotta start getting cameras and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> if, you, right. if you go to the next slide. Um, well, just one, a second, we do have oh, a, one, one oh, quick sorry. question. Art Lieberman, you asked me, uh, do you Sky Planner know the, the actual uh, product is called Deep Sky Planner? by a company called Nightwear. And that's actually a company that is owned and operated by our own Phyllis Lang. Um, and uh, there you go, see what someone has, has put in a uh, deep sky planner. Thanks, Anna. Uh, definitely uh, check that out. It's a great program. Uh, so, all right. So uh, we're gonna move right uh, on and go ahead. Wait, I don't, uh, Carolyn's asking a question. I'm not really sure which meteor shower is the most active. Um, yeah. It depends. Perseids, maybe. I think between it's between the Perseids, those, those the three that I put up there are the most active. But in between those, right about the time you get to September, you have this really long uh, running meteor shower, the Orionids and the Taurids, and they kind of run into one another. So over that time between, literally in in uh, mid to late September through through December, there's a lot of activity. So um, uh, you can actually look this up online. There's, there's places that will actually give you the meteor calendar. But I do think it's between those three. And also a lot of factors like how, how bright is the moon, how many clouds, you know, uh, again, light pollution where you're at in your town also yeah. affect all that. So, and then also where we're at with respect to that debris cloud. Remember, there's a big old cloud of, of debris. There's not just one, but the, as many times as the comet passes around, there will be different clouds. It just depends on which one of those debris clouds we run into, uh, whether or not it's going to be uh, active or not. So it, it really is. Um, but I, I would say between the, I, I, I do agree the Pleiades is, is one of the biggest, but I, I've that one, I, I've seen, I've seen all of them really be super active in the past. It just, there's a lot of factors that go into that. It's a good question though. Any other questions that we have here? Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we go on into the one the things that is really limiting our ability to see the night sky, and that's Dana. Drumroll. That's Dana. <laughs> <laughs> so worldwide, we're starting to um, see a lot of uh, light pollution start kicking in. I, I've noticed it just living in the triangle here. As a as a kid, I used to could go in my parents' backyard and see. Uh, the Milky Way, and even the last time I was there, I was having trouble seeing it. Um, I'm starting to get a little bit of a of, of a passion for for letting people know about about light pollution because we sound like you know we're kind of whining. Hey, I can't see the sky as good. Well, one of the the other factors that I learned the other night, and I'm sorry to go off topic just slightly, Doug, but this was really. Uh, eye-opening to me is when you start investigating this you find out there's a lot of safety concerns here too because the light pollution the way we're doing it you're actually blinding people from being able to to see crosswalks and be able to see muggers it's actually more dangerous the way we do our lighting so if you'll go to the next one doug we can yeah. show uh, this is a this is a picture of uh the united states over time there we go. Yeah, and let me go. just let me just interject here. I've put some information on light pollution. 
uh, and also on interactive light pollution maps in our chat. So you can also pick those up. All right, Dana, go ahead. So the, uh, during the 50s, obviously, you know, the, we're going from 50s to 70s to 1997 to 20 estimation in 2025. So if you're on the east side of the country, you're you're getting hit up a lot with with uh, um, light pollution really bad. It's I mean it's getting to the point where we we have to go out west. I don't need to hear it, Doug. Um, <clears throat> Portal two skies, Lake Montana. <laughs> <laughs> Be there. <laughs> so, but we're we're starting to you know to to really have uh, skies where where uh, it's it's difficult to see anything dark. If you move. Doug, to uh, the next slide, you can actually see North Carolina in 1996. Yep. So I think I, I'll take it over at that point. Yep. Uh, so this is 1996. This is actually when I when I joined the club. This was the light pollution map over North Carolina at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and even at that time in 1996, uh, 27 years ago, you could see where I-40 was. You could see where Raleigh, Durham, uh, you know, uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, you know, the, the, the triad, the Charlotte, the Mecklenburg area, all that you know, was still viewable from space. But there were a lot of dark areas. Now, I do want to say before we actually go to the next slide that we have improved the way that we're reporting. So part of what you're going to see next is, is that we've actually improved our scale for light pollution. But literally, the thing that you can that that hasn't changed are the dark to light areas. And in, in those days, there were still a lot of dark areas. Uh, and I can tell you just from my own experience being with the, the club, as long as I have been, I, I can distinctly remember just the majestic nature of Orion rising up over the town of Apex, you know, when it was literally dark in that area when we were at Big Woods. And now you've got to wait until Orion's about 30 degrees above, uh, has risen about 30 degrees above horizon before you can really begin to, to take any de decent uh, observations or, or any photographs. So it has changed quite a bit. So this is, this is 1996. So let's fast forward to 2010, all right? Now, this is, what, this is what the triangle looked like in 2010. Now this little crosshair here is, is, that you see on the pictures is where we observe from. And in those days, it was in what we call the yellow zone. So it was, uh, it was really, um, you know, more of the in the you know, from the Bortle sky um, perspective. And if you'll give me just a moment to, to pick that out, I'll tell you what that was at the time. For those uh, of you that might not know, Bortle is a it's a scale that we use to tell how dark the skies are from one to seven, I think. So one to nine. Like, but yeah, one to nine. So basically, New York City Times Square is about as bad as it will get as, as it can get but uh yeah so we at that time we're in the yellow zone we were right on the border between what we call bortle uh really a bortle five sky okay which is not good for observing but now you fast forward to 2020 and let's see here click there we go and now that whole area that we are in has now become you know, now that we did, I did move the crosshairs just a bit on this one, but yeah, we're, it's now, we are well into this, really this orange area now. So we've, we've crossed, we've got, uh, we're at the upper end of a Bortle 5 sky. Um, so it's, it, it has gotten much, much worse, not just, not just in the triangle, but you can see all these blue areas that we used to have, we don't have it anymore. They're, they've all been consumed by light pollution. So we are, we are losing our night sky really quickly, but there is a very simple solution that every one of us, every one of us can do. And that's simply flip that switch at night, turn your lights off at night. Now, you know, from a security, if you're, if you're concerned about a security, get yourself like a little ring cam or something that puts out infrared. So it's not visible and, but it'll be able to see uh, the criminals. And it's a lot easier to actually People who, who think that there's, there's not any lights, you know, they won't recognize, oh, I'm being scanned by infrared. So uh, you definitely want to encourage more of that. And as Dana kind of pointed out, 
there is so much with respect to plant health, um, the health of insects, which we need, even though uh, we need insects to actually help, help uh, you know, there's a lot of other animals that, that eat insects and things like that. They can't see the insects to eat. They get starved to death, they die. Um, insects don't breed properly, and so they die off. Uh, turtles uh, aren't able to find um, water sources, so they die. So as you have marine life dying off, you have plant life dying off, birds are confused by lights, they fly into buildings, they crash to earth and die, you're losing migratory bird habitat, you know, and all this begins to affect us. The uh, light pollution itself actually affects us in the sense that it uh, depletes your serotonin and melatonin uh, in your body. These are, uh, not only do they help our sleep process, but they also bathe our cells in a prote in, uh, and protect them from alpha particles, which can cause cancer. So cancers, obesity, things like that have been linked to uh, issues uh, with the disturbance of our own circadian rhythm because of light. So, you know, you do want to just turn off those lights at night, keep them off, even in your bedroom, you know, turn your lights off. And so you two can actually have a better, a better night's sleep. So light pollution is growing and it is a real concern. But of course, for us as astronomers, it's also killing our view of the night sky. Yeah. And so that's why literally and for us to actually get out and see anything really cool, we've got to go to places like Staunton River um, to be able to see, uh, see the night sky. So, all right. So we've when kind of- When you decide to get. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to say, we've kind of talked about what you can see just as a person without any visual aid, now we're going to start talking about those things that you can get to help you actually see more and gather more light into your eyes than the night sky. So, so we're we're going to quickly go through the the different pieces here, but these are these are these are just uh, binoculars and scopes, and so yeah. if uh, we're going to go through those, so the binoculars I think are are one of the unsung heroes of of uh, nighttime observing, uh, a lot of people don't don't really take the the time to go through binoculars. They just want to go out and buy a great old big scope. Um, so I almost always have a pair of binoculars in the car, uh, not because I'm creepy, but because hey, uh, something. Well, that's true too, <laughs> but also because something uh, can pop up. So uh, they're also a very low cost alternative i mean you take a seventy five hundred dollar pair of binoculars you can get pretty good aperture and and pretty good uh seeing with that um you can use them also in the daytime just obviously be careful don't look at the sun with them right um you, you binoculars are also set up for what you see is what you get we like yeah. that term so when you move the scope up you go or the binoculars up you you see upward when you go down you see downward if you got a telescope it's always the opposite directions right um yeah you've got advice down there make sure you use a reputable firm don't don't buy bobs uh <laughs> you know tell uh, bob's binoculars bob's binoculars but um everybody will give you advice on these and whether you use you know pearl prism or roof prism it, it doesn't really matter it's um they're they're both good for yeah. nighttime observing. Yeah, so just to interject here, so kind of, of the, sweet, the sweet spot for binoculars would be what we call 10 by 50s. And yeah. if you, and also too, the poro prism, which is the standard binoculars that you look at, these are pr pr gonna be probably your, ch your cheapest, best price break in binoculars. But 10 by 50s, 10 just, the 10 is just, is 10 X and 50 is the size of the objective on each one of these here. So you get uh, basically a 50 millimeter objective with 10 X out the uh, uh, for magnification. And these are usually the, the best. You can hold them usually easily. They're great, they're portable. Again, you can get 10 by 50s in the roof prism. You might pay just a little more for them, but you know, uh, but it just really depends on, on your preference. It may be a little more difficult to connect roof prism dot, uh, binoculars to a trapezoid mount, whereas usually with poro prisms, trapezoid mounts are made for them. 
And a trapezoid mount is just a special mount that will actually allow you to hold your binoculars steady rather than you just holding them by hand. But you can do a lot of other things. You can use, uh, you can just lean up against the side of your car or even lie on the ground and they'll steady them pretty well. Or you can use a, what we call a monopole, which is just one pole and you connect your binoculars to that. Or you can use a tripod or what we call a trapezoid mount. We're not gonna go into those mounts because we are gonna have an entire program on binoculars. So uh, stay tuned for that. That'll be something that Phil's will be doing in a couple of weeks. All right, go ahead, Dana. You wanna go no, ahead? I'm start? done with binoculars. I All right, to so we'll talk about we'll refractors. Talk about scopes. All right, refractors, all right. Mm -hmm. that, that was yours, but I can talk about it. Oh, no. That is mine. All right, I'll do that. So a refractor is really the, you know, what we think of as a telescope in the mind's eye. Uh, it's just, it really hasn't changed a lot since Galileo's time. There's literally uh, an objective, a, a main objective uh, or lens at the front. And at the end, there is another one. Usually we have like a little eyepiece holder now which, uh, with a mirror that will take the light. Light enters for the front of the tube, travels all the way back. And then it goes out the, the, this little eye ocular or eyepiece hole. And usually you have an eyepiece in there. It's pretty simple. And again, it literally hasn't changed a lot since Galileo's time. But we have, of course, more uh, better glass. It's more pure. Uh, and we've gotten better about putting different elements of glass together to kind of correct for some of the aberrations in light as light passes through glass. Um, the larger you get in terms of refractor, the more expensive it is. Uh, and so the reason why you see a lot of reflecting telescopes is because they're a lot cheaper to make. So, uh, but, and also too, the larger the, the, the glass becomes, the thicker it has to be just so it's, it's able to structurally held, hold itself together. And so the more glass you have, the more um, light you have being kind of aberrated or changed as it passes through the light. So you don't want to, uh, you know, uh, get a really huge uh, 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 refractor. Uh, for, uh, number one, they're, they're, it's really expensive to make, to, to make one that's actually a quality scope. So you're going to pay for that more. But also, too, um, you know, again, anything time you're passing through a medium like glass, it is going to change the properties of the light versus a reflector. The more that you can get uh, reflective surfaces, doesn't really change the, the properties of the light. And so you don't really don't want to change the property of the light until you write, get right to the eyepiece. And in the eyepiece, you can get you know, a fairly high quality uh, view in your image. Again, you know, for all these, it's kind of the same thing. You know, aperture is important, but not as important as it was when I first started as a visual astro astronomer. Back then, aperture was king. But today with new uh, processes like electronically assisted astrophotography, you don't have to worry so much about aperture because you can get some really great pictures with just a three inch aperture. And I, I can tell you, I've got a, a little ST80. Um, it's only about three and a quarter inches uh, in, in diameter. And you can get some amazing shots um, of, of Orion Nebula and many other uh, uh, nebula just with that using a camera. But again, I'm going to hold off on discussing cameras and stuff because we do have a program that we'll do later on on astrophotography and on EAA. So we're going to just uh, stay tuned for that one. But I do want you to let you know is, is that, you know, aperture is important, but and you're going to pay for it the larger the scope comes, especially with refractors. They're much more, it's a, again, a six inch refractor is much more expensive than a six inch Dobsonian telescope, just to let you know that. This is the Captain Jack Sparrow of telescopes. Exactly. All right. Okay. Let's uh, let's go to the next one. All right. So th I think you're up for this one, Dana. Uh, no, no, I am. You are. Okay. So okay. this is this is the Dobsonian telescope, or the Newtonian reflector. The Dobsonian is actually a mount, and you can see that down here. This is my grandson uh, Devin, who's actually looking through one. Now the the Newtonian reflector was actually developed by Sir Isaac Newton. That's why we call it the Newtonian reflector. And he really wasn't trying to create a new telescope. What he was trying to show was that that, that light was split into different uh, chromatic colors and that you could correct, correct, correct what we call chromatic aberration 
with mirrors. And so, but he did out of, out of that create the Newtonian telescope. And the Newtonian telescope is not different than the one he created. So way back in the 1700s, it's still pretty much the same telescope. Again, what we have here, if you look to the right, uh, the uh, light enters in through um, the uh, into the main opening. Uh, there's no no there's no lens here like you have with a refractor. It comes all the way down to a parabolic mirror at the very end, bounces up to a flat mirror, and then out uh, the eyepiece hole here. And you can put an eyepiece in there, and then it allow and you focus it, and you you've got an image. Um, in the 1960s, a man came along named Charles Dobson, and he actually created literally a lazy Susan with a telescope mount on it. And that's what you see my grandson, Devin, down here uh, demonstrating uh, is, uh, is it's so easy to use. Literally, you can buy a Dobsonian telescope, um, take the base out, put the tube, the, what we call the OTA, the op, uh, optical tube assembly, which is this red tube that you see right here, put that in the base and you're ready to observe. And that's what's great about a Dobsonian telescope uh, this was a this one that uh, that my son my grandson Devin is demonstrating is um, a uh, it's an eight inch telescope and uh, literally um, this telescope was manufactured in the 1980s and it's still working today just as good as it did in the 1980s that's the other thing is that they're very durable they last a long time and they can take a beating because this telescope has been all over the place so the the Dobsonian is very easy to use uh, we literally. Um, if, if you're into just doing visual astronomy, this is a great start, scope to start off with because, uh, again, it's easy to set up. It's easy for kids to operate. This is why I demonstrated my grandson here. Now, he's, he's a much older man now, but, uh, you know, this is, um, this was, he, he, was a, he was a young, uh, young boy at the time, and so he is able to uh, just set this up himself and easily find objects on his own. So if you want something that you want your kids to get involved with and you wanna make it easy for them, you might consider getting a Dobsonian telescope. Number one, they're easy to transport, throw the base in the, uh, in the trunk and, 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 uh, and everything, everything could possibly fit in your trunk, drive off to where you wanna observe, take the base out, put the tube in, voila, you're ready to go. That's all there is to it. Just start pointing and shooting. And so they're really great and, uh, and fun to use. And, I, and this, I still have this scope. It's still uh, in use today. And I love taking it out. Dana, you want to say anything about that? Or? Well, the only thing I was going to mention is the only, one of the only downsides is that the scopes are kind of big yeah. uh, in length. So sometimes those of us with, with smaller cars, this won't fit in it. And so taking me to the next slide All what right. we did is we folded up that design one more time and so now the light comes in and it hits that mirror but instead of going out the side what they did is they've corrected at the, the front with a corrector plate so they've got that um, trying to correct the light coming in hits the mirror in the back those two are made in combination and then We've got another mirror on the front to throw it back out again. So this one is about half the, the length for the same diameter as the previous scope. So, and sometimes even, even shorter. And so these are the ones that, you, I'm sorry. Oh. It's, it's actually a third. So if, if a the, third, the, that's right. The Dobsonian folds it twice, the uh, Celestron folds it one more time, which makes it a third shorter. Than the actual focal length so you right i actually so I, a, I, I actually did this as my first scope that i bought actually not the not the coulter but uh and because it could fit in the trunk of my car right that's that's where i was headed oh yeah sorry Go ahead. no no that's what i was saying and so um a lot of people you see these out a lot at, at uh, parties and stuff and they're they're not hard to really hard to set up either but they're much more difficult than than the dobsonians are and they're also usually usually uh have a motor drive in them mm -hmm. so you have to to push you don't just kind of push them around to where you want them um and one of the other problems that you can run into is that you really need to let this one cool down for a really long time as compared to a Newtonian scope. A Newtonian scope, 
the the air uh, that's in there in the mirror, if it's if it's not cooled off properly, you won't. Um, oh, what's that called, Doug? Where the thermal equilibrium. Thank you. Um, where if it if it's not at thermal equilibrium, um, your viewing through the scope will not be as as uh, as good as it can be. And these really can 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 suffer from that. The, yeah. the Schmidt Cassegrains. Yeah. So, so I will, I, let me. I'll just say that that uh, I would say is 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 don't but don't let thermal equilibrium th uh, throw you. Uh, no. I, I've uh, I've I've observed plenty of times, uh, and what it will do is it'll look like the the uh, the the the, um, the star is kind of doing this thing. It's boiling, and that's literally you know that's because the light is changing as the mirror clear uh, uh, clears off. But don't let that stop you from setting up and getting ready to go because. Um, you know, you can still observe, but you're just not going to get that really nice snap until Correct. it does get down to what we call thermal equilibrium. That, all that means is, is that the mirror is about the same temperature as the surrounding air. That's all it means. Right. They're at equalness, equilibrium. So very similar to the Schmidt Cassegrain is the next one he's going to show, unless you've got anything else to talk about on this uh, one. I just will say that that the of course, the advantage is you get a much larger aperture and a smaller space, um, you know, awesome power in a tiny, a teeny tiny living space. But it's uh, but the other thing is, is that it's difficult to move. So, like, if you're like, say, viewing something like Venus or the crescent moon, you're trying to complete the lunar objects and the moon is setting and everything and, it's, and it goes behind a tree. You can always just easily pick up the Dobsonian and move it where you can see it. Once you kind of set the dot, the, the Schmidt down. It's kind of got to stay there because it's really difficult to kind of realign and all that. So you can't yeah. just pick it up and just move it as easily as you can, you know, a Dobsonian. But still, you're getting great aperture. You're getting awesome, uh, awesome view power. I, this is uh, actually this is my my 10 inch here that's in the center here, uh, which I, I love. It's a great scope. But, you know, it's just um, again, once you set it down, um, you don't you don't want to move it. So choose wisely first. Choose wisely, young Scott Skywalker, when you first set up. All right, next one. So, so a play on this is the um, the Max Toff. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, the Max Toff. There we go. Not yet. There we go. There you so, go. Um, I don't actually. It's it's a little bit lighter. Is is one of the main features of this, and I have a Max Toff, and it, it's got Russian made act. Um, um, optics. It was from the from the '90s when I got it. It's got it's it's some really uh, good um, optics that are that are in this. And I if I remember correctly, one of the main reasons is that it's easier to uh, the the corrector lens and the um, the, the the primary lens and or, or uh, mirror in the back are easier to grind than they are on the Smith cast grain. Smith cast grain is is a little more difficult. And so you end up with a with a usually a little bit better optics uh, or a little bit easier to make optics. So cheaper for the for the um, at the same price tag, you probably get a little bit better. But this is this is very, very similar to the Smith Castle grain, but a little bit lighter. So uh, just a kind of an interesting backstory on the Maxitov. This was actually developed in the 1940s by a Russian um, optician named Dmitry Maxitov. And uh, he developed this scope for Russian school children so that they could learn the night sky and they could actually have a cheap telescope. Because one of the neat things is you, you have this really, this interestingly curved correcting lens, but you have the, the mirror, the, the secondary mirror is actually imprinted on the back of the lens. It's actually an, an aluminum dot. So it was really cheap to, uh, to make, but it was a really excellent um, optical okay. scope. In fact, so good that the KGB took it and they made it secret. It was actually secret, uh, a secret design that the KGB used for many, many years until it got leaked to the West. And then the West started, started replicating them. But uh, it is really, it is a, uh, they are much lighter, much smaller. They're easier to manufacture. So I'm not really sure why they're not as popular um, as, the, as the Schmitz, but um, they're definitely an excellent scope. I was disappointed the first time I pulled out my 8-inch Schmitz Cassegrain because I thought it would be just this order of magnitude almost better to yeah. view, and it was not. I yeah. still like the views from this. Yeah, and how big is your Mac? Is it 6 or six. what is it? Six. Yeah. 
Yes, and I, uh, I think almost in the U.S., it, you know, it's very rare to find anything that's larger than a six in yep. a Mac. Yeah. All right, perfect. All right, great. So let's go on to the next one. I think now we have some. Uh, um, this will be a good chance uh, for you guys to talk. Uh, uh, any questions? And let's look over chat real quick, and we'll uh, uh, see if there's anything out there. I see someone uh, made a mention that they love their 25 by 70s, and that was that was Anastasia. And I do want to kind of uh, that's a really good point that Anna or by saying the 25 by 70s, uh, you know, the the 10 by 50s, as I said before, are kind of the sweet spot where you can kind of hold them. And once you kind of go above that and you get into the 75s and, and above, the the lenses, you know, and the prisms that you need to make binoculars become much more heavy. So you will need some type of mount or something. Again. We're gonna we're gonna uh, save that over until uh, until we get into the the binocular uh, project later on. All right. Uh, all right. There are any questions, so we'll move on. So we'll talk a little bit about you know we in astronomy in North Carolina. You know we we actually are lucky. We live in a, in a state and in an area where there's a lot of astronomy. Sorry. It's it's kind of an odd thing that when we think about North Carolina. Our darkest area in North Carolina is actually east of I-95, you know, but um, and then way out into the mountains. But east of I-95, <laughs> there's not any astronomy. There's not any astronomy clubs. So it's kind of it's, it's one of those weird uh, contradictions. You'd think there'd be more astronomy clubs out there, but there aren't. But in our area, we have some great things. We will talk about Astronomy Day in a second. We have star parties, which we will talk about uh, not long from now. And there's all kinds of observing sessions, and of course lectures like this, and of course the, and, uh, west of I-95 and north of I-40, we have a lot of of astronomy clubs. So, all right, so let's go to the next one. All right, so astronomy days. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys were actually able to attend astronomy days. I actually got sick of this last year and I couldn't attend, but this is just a couple of the pictures that we have of astronomy days. It's always generally the last uh, Saturday and Sunday in January. It's just a really cool astronomy fest. We generally have somewhere between 14 and 15,000 people. Now over COVID, we had to take it virtual, but um, this year was our first year that we didn't, uh, that we were actually in uh, um, that we were actually back in the museum as it happens at the Museum of Natural Science again last uh, the uh, last weekend of January of any year and it's just a really great time uh, where you can really will have a lot of astronomy exhibits it's a great time for you to learn now being uh, all of you on this call are club members and this is also a great time for you to volunteer and we usually set you up with an astronomer like you see over here on the right we've got Mike Keith here who's explaining the astrophysics or the astro planets or sorry the exoplanet exhibit and uh, so we usually pair you up with a trained astronomer who knows the exhibit and you can learn a lot just in one or two hours of being at a particular exhibit and then we usually give you the opportunity to float off to another one and it just really will help you kind of kickstart your astronomy skills but not only your skills and knowledge but also your confidence and that's really part of it. We find that uh, even though uh, is, let's say you're new, you're just starting out with the club, because you have that passion for astronomy and you've always been kind of looking and learning astronomy on your own, you're probably already 95% above what the average person knows on the street. So you shouldn't ever, ever be uh, apprehensive about volunteering at this event. Again, it's a great way to help kickstart your astronomy uh, uh, knowledge and your confidence. Um, I, I've always enjoyed um, mm -hmm. uh, volunteering at this event because it, it also increases my knowledge and it's, it's just a lot of fun. Go ahead, Dana. I think I know you were there. So, no, I loved it. I was yeah. right behind the guy with the backpack. Um, mm -hmm. Once again, nobody photographed me or interviewed me or anything as usual. Um, that's probably a good thing is what I was waiting I was for you to say, Doug. That. <laughs> That's a good thing. But I will, I will add to, um, to the statement that you made. It's, it really, nobody's throwing you into the fire here. 
Um, yes, you're on your feet all day. Yes, you go home tired. Um, but it's not like you're sitting there, people asking you questions that you have no idea about or anything. Nobody's going to throw you into that. And so it actually becomes a lot of fun. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great learning event because there's always questions that you actually don't know, but you can find out from somebody around exactly. or you, you know, so I, I agree. I, I had a very good time at this this year. All right, super. Well, let's go on to the next one. So we have, besides astronomy days, we also have observing sessions. Yay. Okay. These right, are my, yeah, this right. is one of my favorite things. And I think you were doing solar observing here. Is this Chapel Hill? Nope, this is actually Prairie Ridge, and we were doing the Venus transit, the transit of Venus back in, I think it was 2011, I think. Oh, okay. So there's um, observing sessions that we we try to do at least one a month, um, but usually we do more than that. Um, we have a we have partnered with uh, Three Bear Acres and uh, up in, uh, or the Triangle Land Conservatory, um, but specifically the site Three Bear Acres, which is over kind of between um, Falls Lake and Creedmoor. And we do a lot of observing sessions and outreach out there. Those observing sessions are open to the public. Um, the, uh, these particular sessions are, you can, we do observing sessions uh, called uh, Rack Ops, that is the Raleigh Astronomy Club observing, and those are specifically for club members, uh, both of which uh, I find uh, wonderful to go to because there's always a lot of help, uh, and, and you find people walking through that, I mean, literally you've got the whole end of the spectrum uh, in these observing sessions. You've got people that, that don't even know how to put up their telescope to people who've been observing for 20 plus years and so it's always i think a lot of a lot of fun yep and you know always look look at our calendar because all the information that you need for observing and stuff like that um and how to get there this and the dress and stuff like that, that is all on our calendar so if you will uh if you'll go there um if you're interested just look at our calendar pick an observing site or an observing session register for it you'll get information on how to get there and everything. And, um, and so you'll be able to participate as a club member, again, uh, being, even though you're new and you may be new, you are welcome. And this is your observing session. It's not just, you know, Doug Lively or Dana or somebody else. This is for you. And this is part of what, what you, uh, you know, you paid your club dues for is to actually be um, able to observe and to learn from it. And there's always people there who are willing to help. So you yep. don't have to feel like, you know, you're just out there and abandoned. There's plenty of people there to help you with any questions that you have. And we always like doing that. So. And the, right. so the difference between an observing session, which he's showing here, this is usually the public is invited and it's usually a session. So you go out and you observe for hours, four hours, three mm -hmm. or four hours. Yeah. Now, if you take this to the next level, um, you go into what we call star parties, and these are usually these are usually events where you set them up to to stay overnight, maybe multiple nights. Uh, uh, the one that's coming up the this in in a week and a half, uh, what we call Staunton River Star Party, is it's a full week. Uh, you can go for two hours, but uh, why do that when you can spend the night on the on the field? And so these are club members. They are all kinds of people that pay to go to this. And by pay, it's usually just a minimal fee uh, to, to, to usually the cost is covering staying on the field and stuff. But the most I have ever learned anything astronomy or, or photography or, or observing has always been at one of these. So um a Doug Lively, a person who's very knowledgeable, or a Mike, or or just uh, lots of people, they'll they'll come up, and I'll be struggling with something, or I walk up to them, and they'll be struggling with something, and you help each other out. Star parties to me are are the most fun, but these are generally overnight. Yeah. In this one, you see the is that um, 
Bruno's over there on the left, Doug? That is Bruno's big 36 inch. I think it's a 36 yeah, it's, inch you, scope, right? Yeah. So the joke is that no matter what you take to the star party, your your chest is puffed out. You think I'm going to show <laughs> these guys what they'll observe this year. You get there and you immediately sag because yeah, Bruno yeah. shows up with a 36 inch or or somebody shows up with a with a big old 14 inch schmidt cassegrain that takes three people to load it and exactly you, so it's always a lot of and everybody wants to share everybody yeah. wants to let you observe through their equipment sorry i didn't mean to go off but this is one of my most favorite things to do oh mine too it's it's a great it's a great chance for you for you to kickstart your astronomy knowledge i do want to say for those of you who are new in the club if you didn't know we are having a star party at staunton river state park you can just go to the web and look up Staunton River, unless you've got the link there, Danny, and you can put it in, in the in the chat. Registration for this star party is still open. It's still it's open through the 15th of March. So if you want to go and you can choose, you can either go for a, like a day or so, or if you want to like spend like a couple of days out there, you can do that. Um, but it's a great opportunity. You get to set your scope up. You don't have to tear it down. It, your equipment's safe. You know, um, and you can, um, you know, you'll have a great time just observing. And you, like, as Dana said, uh, it's same with me. I've learned so much at these star parties. And so you'll, well, there will be lectures there. There'll be people speaking. Um, and uh, so there's lots of great ways and great opportunities to learn in a safe, friendly, fun environment, you know. And, you know, you can bring your family, you know, as long as you're not, you know, if, if your, if your price as an astronomer, as long as you're not putting extra scopes on the field, it's yours. You know, you bring your family and everything. They don't get charged any extra for coming. Yep. So, all right, let's go on because we are getting out of time here. Uh, sorry for, for the overage, but there's a lot of great information here. And so we definitely wanted to give you guys as much information as possible uh, in this video. All right. So. Just a little bit about Raleigh Astronomy Club. It actually started as an astronomy class, a field observing class back in the, in the late 1970s. Since then, we've grown from about, uh, I want to say it was about 14 people to well over 500 people. We have, have about 535 people in the club now. Uh, so there are a lot of folks here. And again, for all of you who have joined us and for those of you who will watch this video in the future, we want you guys to do everything you can to get involved because this is your club. This is your opportunity to, to learn about astronomy. We do think we are trying to you know, promote night sky literacy, literacy. We do this through observing sessions. We are a member of the Astronomical League, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Also too, we are also a member of the NASA JPL Night Sky Network. Many of our members, uh, we are getting, we've got about seven or eight NASA JPL solar system ambassadors actually in our group, among which Dana is one, and Anastasia is another, Mike Keefe is another, and there are many others, Brian Cummings. Um, so there are other people who are also um, members of the NASA JPL solar system ambassadors. We are an all volunteer organization. That does, so that means that, you know, we're, none of us are paid. Uh, to do what we do. We all do it because we love to do it. So uh, if you're thinking about getting involved in leadership, that's part of we, we could really use uh, your help on doing a lot of the things that we do with with Alcor, with the telescope loaner program, with, um, you know, observing sessions, with setting up classes and stuff like that. We could uh, social media outreach, all these things we could we desperately need others to volunteer uh, to help out with. Um, and then at the very end, again, it's about nurturing that passion for the night sky. One of the ways that we do that, we help you actually become a better astronomer and, and to actually do uh, more with, with astronomy are through, is through our partnership with another, another organization called the Astronomical League. And uh, the Astronomical League has come up with several uh, observing programs that will actually help you uh, get better at the at uh, at observing. I'm actually uh, putting a um, a link or uh, several links there in chat to some programs. If you actually just do those four programs, that will take you from the novice level all the way up to the beginning intermediate level in astronomy, and and uh, and that will really uh, bolster your confidence and everything. So I put those in there, but in my position at Rack. 
I am um, I am also the the Alcor, which we call the Astronomical League Coordinator. Uh, this is actually me a number of years ago receiving an award from our former one of our former Astronomical League coordinators, Phyllis Lang. Um, again, she's actually now running her own software company where she develops astronomical software. But um, you can get uh, an award, and when you do, you also get these really cool observing pins, like you see right here hanging around my neck. Um, and as you get observing awards and observing pins, those all work towards uh, several levels of what we call master observer. And so um, there's not just one master observer level, there are many levels, but I'm at the first master uh, observer level and we have other members of our club who are also master observers. But working towards those, those um, levels, uh, every time you complete a program and an award, you actually are increasing your knowledge and also your confidence in astronomy. And I know Dana's done a, quite a few of them. You want to speak to what you've done there, Dana, and everything? Um, I'm working on the fourth one now. I've done Lunar, which was the most enjoyable. I've done Constellation Hunter, which was the most annoying because there's that <laughs> one constellation that took me three trips to get it. Yes. And, and uh, you're, you know, but Beyond Polaris is really good because it's mm -hmm. a, a very beginner program. Um, there, I mean, those, those programs, you're not kidding. I need structure when I observe. I don't go out and go, okay, God, let me have it. Um, yeah. I, I actually go out there and, and for the sake of, uh, I want to, to specifically learn um, things and observe things in in the sky that night and so i'm very structured and so the the alcor program is very structured uh, or not very structured uh, is, is structured in a way that i find um appealing as an engineer and stuff so i've done three out of four of those um i'm a third of the way through the messier and uh once again there's a certain person who's here that i'm looking forward to seeing at staunton river to help me with that uh, there, uh, Mr. Presley. And, uh, so we will, there's others that I'm working on as well. That's another yeah. thing is I enjoy working on multiple at the same time. Cause if you do lunar, then every time the moon is in the way, um, you have something to do, you got something to do. You can't just go, Oh, well, I got nothing to do. Let me go flip the TV on. You've always got something that you can be working on. So, or, uh, just, uh, break out the old emodium, uh, U-232s, uh, uh, planet equalizer and just knock the moon out of, out of orbit you can do exactly that. you know so, so. Yeah. and and again you the get you know yeah. there's there's other programs there's some where you actually do hands-on you make stuff like i've yeah. you know i'm making you know astrolabes and stuff like that so it's a lot of fun right. i think it is yeah. anyway i have to agree with you they're a lot of fun to complete and again your confidence uh, really grows with every award. Now we do, uh, we will, when it, with the award, we will, you'll get a pin and you'll get an award. We will award that at a club meeting. So we'll also give you some recognition for your work and everything. So they're a lot of fun. You have those good looking guys with really good hair, like in that picture. <laughs> yeah, my hair, hair is not doing so good. All righty. So um, that, uh, so um, I really appreciate you guys uh, hanging with us and staying my, that's really kind of the uh, the end of our, our program. Um, this is, you know, Raleigh Astronomy Club is, is your club. And it's, it's here to really help you um, actually become a better astronomer. You're really going to uh, nurture your, your passion for astronomy if you do work through these programs, if you do try to attend club meetings and get to know the people who are astronomers. This is just a, the picture here is just a few of the people that we have in the club. But I definitely want to encourage you guys to get out and and uh, and get involved. Uh, and again, if you if you really want to build that um, that that sky knowledge and everything, the AL programs and getting it with the other astronomers are is really the way to do it. Uh, so now we're going to open it up to questions. Um, if you guys want to, um, I think what I'll do is let's see. Can I just unmute everybody here at once? That might be kind of crazy, but. Um, if you like, you can go ahead and unmute your, your microphones if you have a specific question you want to ask. And then. Um... Hey, guys. Or, uh huh. Yeah. Uh, real quick, all of these links you put on there, we're actually 
working kind of on a remote computer. Is there any chance you could, uh, you know, maybe post an email with a lot of this information uh, for us to peruse later? Yeah, it's being uh, the chats will be saved with the recording. And what I can do is, is I can actually make that available one day in a post. Um, and uh, I can I'll talk with the with the other leadership, see how they actually want to have make that happen. But yeah, the everything that's here in the chat uh, should be recorded. Uh, it usually is. And so I'll definitely make it uh, make it happen. If for some reason you don't see it and you have a question about something you did see, don't hesitate to drop me an email. I'll be glad to send you whatever information you're looking for if it didn't get out. I'm going to um, um, Lady Jane, Lady, L A D Y E. Lady Jane. Uh, uh, if you, I have some links if you want to send it directly to me. Um, if okay. you want to send an email to uh, dbostick at gmail.com, I'll, I'll send those to you. I can put them in the chat, but um they're just I, I guess i could do that this is about I'm, just, I'm i've currently um a friend of mine brought me one as a gift from um morocco a very very old one it's absolutely gorgeous oh. and so i've been working on, <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a picture i'll email you a picture it's the most beautiful thing i've ever seen and so i just thought it'd be so fun to make a kind of a modern current day version so i've been like playing with that so I, I can email you separately, but I figured maybe there's other people in the group that were interested as well. Oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah. And so uh, I, yeah. If, you, if you'd share it with everyone, just in case anybody else is interested, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, to me, uh, an astrolabe is, is so amazing because just with some, some just with just bare geometry, um, ancient man could predict so many things with an astrolabe. It's, a cra it's crazy. And, and so, I mean, we, we have, we think that, oh yeah, we've got to have a computer with sky mapping software and all mm -hmm. this. And, no, man, all, all, uh, all, all ancient man needed was an astrolabe. And again, it's really just using just basic geometry and trigonometry and wow. I mean, they did it. And so that's, I think it's pretty amazing. There's a PDF you can download in that, in that set of links that I sent mm -hmm. that, um, you can you can use a, a laser printer or a and and um, it'll I think it's that very last one yeah in the links that I sent um, it's one of those I don't remember and um, uh, and, and uh, but it it works for, I mean that's what I'm showing you here and and I am not oh sorry I'm not very craft oriented um, as a matter of fact my my but wife you, but you are but crafty. I, <laughs> but I'm crafty, but I'm, but I, I built this one and, and I've done, you know, as they said, you know, you, you just, you've got the, you, you hang it and use the astrolabe. That it, is it all, so amazing that you made that. Like I'm a graphic designer and design things for a living. So you and I should talk. <laughs> well, and I went to um, Washington DC with my kids right after this to take them to the Smithsonian. And there's, there's all kinds of astrolabes down in the Smithsonian. And so it, it, you know, my boys now know where they didn't really care so much before about it, but dad's building this. And then all of a sudden they see, oh, he's building this because the ancients did this. And you, you get what I'm saying. So, yeah. well, that's great. pretty cool. Thank you. Of course. Cool. Great. All right. Are there any, any more questions? We have time. Yeah. We don't have to, you know, we, uh, of course, we, we are quite a bit over the, uh, the, the hour and a half, but I, we're really here to answer any questions that anyone has. It doesn't have to relate to introduction to astronomy. If you're having a difficulty with your telescope or you want to know about something in the night sky, something that you saw, you know, this is a good chance to, to uh, ask that question. I will add something, and I, I didn't say it a while ago, but, and maybe that's just me, uh, Doug, but as, as you know, the, the two most fun times that I've had, um, we go up to that three bare acres and um, that's an hour drive for me. So it's got to be something I'm really kind of enjoying or I'm not going to do that. And so it, it's kind of fun to show other people. I know one night I had Anna, correct me if I'm wrong, like six families behind us and, and Anna and I 
were using my telescope and I was displaying what was the telescope was seeing on the screen and I was not using the go-to and it was James Webb was big on the news and the, and the, and the enjoyment that you get when like six kids between the ages of like eight and 14 figure out that they're actually looking at the star and they found it themselves that James Webb focused on to start with that, that was, that was really an enjoyable night to me because they just lit up when they found it. So there's, that was, and, and I, that, was I, that, that was actually a, that one. And that was actually an AL challenge. It was you got, that you and Anna got uh, certificates for. Correct. Uh, yeah. But, um, but the, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a lot of fun and you learn a lot. The kids will ask questions because they're not scared of, do I look stupid or whatever? And so you get all kinds of questions. I got asked one night, well, can we see the, the, because the moon was just a little sliver and somebody walked up and said, well, could we see that the dark part? And so I just slid the, i never thought about it. So I just overexposed the moon while not looking at the, the lit part and you could see it. And it looked like it was, um, almost a full moon there so there's there's a lot of things that they get you to 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 think about talk about and do that wouldn't be normal so i i really push the outreach they um i have a really good time with that i mean if you're just anti-kid and stuff i get it but um it's it's been really enjoyable to 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 outreach because that's where a lot of the questions get asked that are that are um i find very enjoyable Excellent. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and reiterate what, what uh, Dana is saying. If you have an idea, just try it. This is yep. the thing that's really fun about astronomy. You can try stuff. You know, nobody, may, nobody may have thought about it before, and so it's a great opportunity. So I'm just going to kind of close this out now. I, I really appreciate everyone that's actually joined today, and hope you had a good time uh, reviewing the the material. Uh, again, for those of you who will see this at a later date and time, uh, we just want to encourage you again to nurture that passion for astronomy that's inside of you. Do that through, you know, doing some of the naked eye astronomy that we talked about, observing, safely observing the sun, the moon, and some of the other objects in the night sky. Don't hesitate to reach out to those of us in the club with questions. You can do that through the listserv on our Discord server. Or, um, or even just you know through um, you know our, our social interactions when you're out at the, at the observing sites. We are Raleigh Astronomy Club. We are your club, and we are here to serve one another and to literally to nurture each other's passion for astronomy. And I hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and look forward to seeing you in future presentations. Hope you all have a good day and clear skies to come. Bye now. Thank you.